A warm welcome to Berlinale Talents, a warm welcome to the How Hebel am Ufer again. For those who know Berlinale Talents, they know that we're advocating hardly and heavily for the idea of film as something collective, as something that goes through all the disciplines and storytelling is done in all the different departments and all the different ways how uh, a film is made. And for today, uh, we will uh, exemplify that here again in this session, but also this session is a very good example on, uh, for you to understand how Berlinale Talents as a network, as a community works, because we are not only inviting 200 talents every year, we are also re-inviting those who have been with us over the years, and many of them come back with films, they come back as experts in all cases, and they are sitting here connecting, reconnecting, however you want to call it, with you as an audience, but also with the new talents so that the community can grow. And for today, it's very simple for me, so I don't have to say, this is an alumna or this person is there. I simply say, everyone is an alumni. So because everyone on screen and here also with us in the room have been at Berlinale Talents before. So my pleasure is to introduce you to Ellen Lottman, who is the moderator of today, and she will introduce you and her fellow cinematographers here and on screen, and you are introduced to how Berlinale Talents works. So enjoy. Hello and welcome to everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here physically. Uh, we, we have this hybrid uh, team of uh, alumni here. We have Ari Wagner on the screen. Uh, and um, Ari is a uh, talent um, alumni from which year, Ari? Um, look that up and I didn't. <laughs> a long time ago. It's just at least 10, 15 years, maybe 10 years. So that shows, uh, that, <laughs> that shows that uh, if you're a talent, then after this, life just flies by <laughs> in a good way. So we also have Marta Shimoyes. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes. Esh went to, it should be in the end. Uh, Marta has a, has a film here this year uh, in, uh, oh. in the forum program. Yeah. And uh, we will have a chance after this introduction to see the trailers of all the three films that, uh, that the beautiful cinematographers who are here have brought uh, with us for this, uh, for this evening. And Jenny Lou Siegel is uh, on my right. Uh, which years were your talents? I think I was 2014. Me too. Yeah. Oh. Great. <laughs> so, talent network right here. Yeah. Both of you have films in the program this year, and um, uh, the films Supernatural and Afterwater are uh, mm, in uh, in Forum and Panorama. Right. Forum, as well. Uh, and also, uh, Ari has <laughs> has fantastic news because uh, uh, her film. And the power of the dog has been nominated for multiple Academy Awards, and among them also the Cinematography Award. So, we, when we planned this evening, then Ari was supposed to be back home, but now she has just arrived to LA. So, time zone-wise, she's in a better place. <laughs> uh, we will talk about cinematography. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Ellen. I'm a cinematographer, and uh, I feel that I'm a talent like pensioner, <laughs> because I just real yesterday I realized that I was uh, in the Berlinale Talents in 2004, which I was two years old when this happened, so I was very talented. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, among other things, uh, this year I have also been mentoring Camera Studio Talents, which has been really exhilarating and a very nice experience. And uh, it has, uh, let's say, it has forced me to look back uh, from 
uh, from the point of view of where I am now to, to back to when I was a talent. And I would like to start this uh, talk today with something that, that I wrote to the camera studio talents. Is that uh, talent, the word talent sometimes is, is, is misunderstood. We tend to think that talent is something unexplainable and given to some and not given to others and, and only by, by stumbling and stumbling you might find out whether you have it or not. But actually the word comes from ancient Greek and it means perseverance. So talent means not giving up. And uh, when I understood this, I thought, okay, so maybe the fact that I was a, a talent in 2004 and I'm here now actually means that I am a talent. I didn't give up and <laughs> I fought my way to Berlin. Today we talk mostly about cinematography. It's, uh, um, the talk is, is, uh, is a public talk, so uh, we're not going to have like secret cinematographer's talk. We will talk about cinematography in a wider sense and cinematography as seeing. And of course, um, you, the audience, you are very welcome to jump in. If you want to ask questions, then you can raise your digital hands and uh, we will have you here on the screen. We can hear your questions and I will open up for questions between the talk. And I also have to say that <laughs> because we're all cinematographers here on this stage, probably you have like four shyest people uh, <laughs> in Berlin or in the world now because Ari is in LA so we would rather prefer to be behind the camera we have been thrust in this spotlight so we might mess up we might uh, get <laughs> confused and we promise we'll not run away from here but uh, if we get confused then always images help us so we for this uh, to start this talk and to have this a little bit less confusing um, I want to start uh, the evening with watching the three trailers of the three films of these three fantastic cinematographers that we have here. And while we watch it, we can hide behind the images. And when we come back, then we have gathered a, a bit of guts to talk about the stuff. So let's see the trailers.
So, as it is accustomed for cinematographers, the first trailer was without sound. <laughs> so, to respect the beautiful sound design of Power of the Dog, we'll just watch the trailer once more with sound. Better with sound. So, uh, I hope the first chance without the, without the sound was a possibility to to focus on the images. So every film, uh, when it starts for a cinematographer, it's a it's a story, that how the film comes to the cinematographer's life and and what happens during the pre-production of the of the film. And because today we want to talk about the cinematography in a wider sense, cinematography, not only as being behind the camera and making decisions there, but as cinematography as seeing, as a way of seeing, as a way of seeing professionally. So every pre-production of each film is unique and uh, is interconnected with, with the film itself, with the form and with the team. So to start uh, today's talk, I want to ask uh, a little bit about the backstories of the films that we uh, we saw the trailers. So first, uh, if uh, Ari, you can uh, tell us a little bit about how Power of the Dog started for you and um, and cover a little bit of this process of pre-production. Yeah. Um, so I uh, had actually met Jane maybe three or four years before uh, Power of the Dog kind of existed we did a, a very small commercial together um i kind of occasionally do commercials and she doesn't really do commercials but um this one came to her and um a mutual friend of ours recommended me um said that we might like working together and we we really did um and then yeah we both kind of went our own separate ways i went and did some films and she did a whole tv series and then uh yeah then one day she just called me and said what are you what are you up to the next couple of years <laughs> um and and would you um like to know a bit more about this this book i just read and i'm just in the middle of doing the script um and of course um yeah i said yes um <laughs> whatever you were if 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 uh if you would be interested in talking more, I would absolutely. And I read the book straight away and it was incredible. Um, yeah, then I guess I got the job. And then, um, yeah, one of the things that Jane really wanted was to, to have a DP that could be really with her for that whole entire pre-production, not just kind of the last bit, which usually, as I'm sure you guys all know, is, you know, maybe it's six weeks, maybe it's eight weeks. If you're really lucky, maybe it's like 12 weeks, but, but she wanted someone that would be kind of with her throughout the director's whole pre-production really, which starts way before we, we kind of arrive um, and be involved in really early location scouting. And, you know, we had to design a whole house and find a ranch to shoot on and figure out how to shoot Montana and New Zealand. And, um, lots of really challenging sequences that actually none of us had kind of done before, like um, you know, stuff with lots of cattle and um, you know the dreaded two people talking on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> the worst, um, that kind of stuff that we wanted um, to work through, not in a rushed way, but really like find the best solution, not just the first solution. Um, so yeah, I spent most part of the year. I mean, when I say 
um, you know, years pre-production. He wasn't full time with Jane and it was really a choice I made to say, yes, I could have done kind of other projects and commercials kind of in between. But you know, when when someone like Jane calls you and says, are you available? We're shooting in a year. That that feels like tomorrow, you know, it feels like I got to get moving. I need there's so much work to do and, and really my mind couldn't think about anything else. Um, once I knew that was that was coming down the line, even a year felt like really soon. Yeah. You had a very interesting experience with Jane, uh, uh, where she knew that she wanted to have a special, like a bit longer time with you during the pre-production. Yeah, she really. I think she's really good with her gut instinct. Um, it's it's actually, you know, really amazing how much she's able just to like whatever is her gut instinct. She can say it, and it's. I really learned a lot from that actually. Like. Um, whether that's a fear or a desire, and I think she said that very early on. Like, I want a DP that's with me from the from that whole year, um, and yeah, it was. I think maybe from her past experience, having um, done a lot of the pre-production kind of herself before the DP arrived, that this time she wanted a real like long collaboration, I guess, and and that you know, in many ways, the director and DP relationship. Yes, it's on set, but so much of it is is kind of before that happens, like when you really start to form like the really tight friendship and, and collaboration, then almost like once you get on set and there's all these other people, in many ways you spend the least amount of time together on set. You're kind of both doing your own, taking care of the actors, got to be taken care of by the director and you actually kind of end up actually spending the least amount of time together. So we we knew that having that long time together by the time the set part happened would be kind of a really tight team and it wouldn't matter so much if we didn't actually get to talk that much during the day. You know, obviously we're kind of side by side setting up the shot and stuff, but but a lot of that work's kind of already been done. Um, and, and yeah, just knowing as well that there's, no matter how, what scale of production, there's always moments that get difficult you know when the sun's going down or something didn't happen as fast as we'd hoped it would or something changes and knowing that you've got just a kind of a tight friendship is so key to know that that person's not going to kind of you know not just freak out but kind of blame you for something or like that you're you just like feel very protected and protective of each other as well that if we either of us would see something kind of on the horizon that was going to you know somehow upset the other person or, or be unexpected to them that we you know if you kind of when you're friends you just have this protective instinct which is like i don't know feels really important film set such a vulnerable place for a director really i see marta is nodding already here so yeah. so <laughs> so this uh, this talk about uh, this intuitive relationship with the director uh i felt that uh, that this is uh, has a lot to do with the uh, with the style of the of your film, which is very intuitive. Yeah, it's nice that you can see it in the film. Actually, I'm happy about that <laughs> because um, yes, with uh, George, the director of this film, um, we actually studied together in film school, and we've been working together ever since, which is very nice. I think when you're a cinematographer, if you get to work more than once with the same person you have the chance to sort of like develop this relationship um, deeper and deeper as you go along from project to project I guess and also we are quite uh, close uh, friends in in real life let's call it like that <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's also a privilege because when it comes to filming things just happen in, in a very intuitive way because communication is, is easy and I always feel like maybe 80% of our job is being able to communicate and, and, and share ideas and exchange thoughts. So that part is sort of like already taken care of in a way. So when we get to the actual act of filming, things are just uh, supernatural. <laughs> Uh, so we just, um, I think that for me it's easy to understand what he's looking for in some situations. So I can already have my eye on something that's happening and 
and and for for him it's easy to to also tell me what he's planning to do with 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 some of the sequences and so it just flows in a very nice way uh, of course, we also talk a lot about the projects and discuss them, so it's not only just this uh, intuition kind of thing, like you were saying, you know, these relationships, they're also about actual work, you know, actual filming and, and, and looking at the footage and see what works and what not and what doesn't. And I think that what exists between us is the same feeling towards what works and what doesn't, so we're kind of always... Um, in tune uh, when it comes to that, which mm -hmm. is really nice. Jenny, your project is also very, um, let's say, it has a lot of it is so, is so much connected to images and sounds that it's almost hard to imagine how this project can be put to words. It feels like it should go translate directly from emotions to the, to the screen. So how was the, like, uh, not pre-production, let's say, de developing this whole story, um, not even story, developing this whole film and, and the collaboration with the director in creating something so specific. It's um, actually quite the same like with Marta and, and her director because I've been good friends with a director for maybe eight or nine years and we met in a cinema at Arsenal here in Berlin and had a drink after and talked. I don't remember the film, but like our friendship is very much based on the cinema, but we are friends also in other terms. And that's such a shortcut into making a movie. As Ari said, it's like really, I mean, it's so important to connect and we, I mean, we go to exhibitions together anyways. We go to music concerts together anyways. We go to the cinema anyway. That's what you do in preparation of a film, you go, you talk about paintings, you talk about music, and you talk about so many things or books. And if you, yeah, if you have that friendship and you have that mutual understanding of what cinema is for you, but also what cinema is for the world, that makes such an easy approach, mm -hmm. and it's, it's such a nice way to making films. I mean, it's also there's disadvantages of being friends maybe sometimes but like the advantages advantages are much much higher and um, um, there were not honestly in the preparation I thought about it this morning I don't remember there was like a document of course there was <laughs> a text not a script um, it was not too long that I remember and um, it really changed over the time, but um, yeah, we communicated not so much in words, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and anyways, we didn't prepare. I mean, it's such a different film <laughs> than Power of the Dog. We didn't need to prepare for a year. I mean, we had very limited resources, and that's, I mean, that's the key, one of the key elements in filmmaking is to acknowledge your resources mm. or to acknowledge like your circumstances and for that film we had like very limited time and very 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 limited resources and the great thing of working with a director that he really understands like what that means and that is like such an important mm. part in like really knowing what you can achieve and like not dreaming of bigger things than you can do and that is really such a I'm feel, I feel I'm Leaving the uh, your uh, no, you're not. You're question, actually getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is like s I don't know. I feel that is also like such a big learning point mm -hmm. over the last years, or part of being a talent. Like really learning to understand what's offered to you from the director, translating that in images, but first of all, translating that in like possible ways of filming of yeah, time you have, time you need, mm -hmm. what you can achieve. It's actually very nice that you took this question forward because uh, uh, in the camera studio talk that, w that we had yesterday with the, with the camera studio participants, we, we also discussed this um, fact that wherever you are in your career, you have different choices or whether, whichever film you are doing, you have different choices, which means that uh, every film in a way is, in, is unique. But uh, what you learn from working in this, let's say, seeing the world as a cinematographer, 
you have to be able to bring it with you to bigger productions and to smaller productions if you're doing a small documentary. You have to be able to transform yourself in a way that you see what is in front of you. And at the same time, with, with bigger productions, there is also this uh, challenge of how to keep this emotional space, uh, or this intimate and small emotional space. And Ari, I, I really liked the, uh, one of the things that when we prepared for this talk, you mentioned uh, how Jane protects herself from the, like the practical realities of filmmaking to try to keep this uh, intimate uh, connection that you build uh, in this long period where it's just you and her yeah she um again like i said earlier she's so great at in many ways being a advocate for herself and i think that starts from really knowing like what you need as a kind of person or a creative person whether that's you're someone that needs to, you know, go to the locations like multiple, multiple times or um, for Jane, it was um, from the very start of pre-production, she had kind of a month that would be protected for just her and the actors and a month for her and me that would, would be kind of uninterrupted and very protected. And um, I guess also part of that is, you know, having producers that, that can kind of choosing the right producers for for a director to know you know someone that's going to support your choices and how you want to do it because um, I think there can often be a like a idea that all films have to be kind of made the same way and that if a director wants to do something differently then they're somehow difficult or or like not complying to how it should be done but but there's can be as much creativity in how a film's made as there is kind of on the screen. It's not a locked kind of Excel spreadsheet. There can be as much creativity in, you know, what the shoot day looks like, what the pre-production looks like, what, a, and I think that all comes from what, how a director wants to work and, and what they need. And I see that is in my role as kind of tuning into that and being super predictive of that. And that kind of goes to every level, whether it's, how they like their director's monitor set up, like what's going to work for them, kind of for them to be in the most comfortable, natural space. And I think you can see that in the work when, you know, like I was saying, a film set such a can be such a vulnerable and like high pressure environment for a director. I really see it as part of my role to do whatever I can to make it comfortable for them, even if that's not, you know, the way it usually kind of should be or whatever. It doesn't, you know, no one. There's no kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> there's no prizes for like most conventional film ever, you know, pre-production, best spreadsheet, or, you know, it's like kind of whatever, whatever works for you. It's great. It's, and, and I think really tuning into a director's, you know, whatever their strangest kind of idiosyncratic kind of need is, I will like fight really hard to make sure that they can have that because it's, um, yeah, I think it's important and I think it really built bonds that like ally kind of friendship and protective instinct to have <laughs> towards a director because as well I think we as as DPs cinematographers we are probably on set more than most directors as well so I think it can be the set can be very kind of familiar to us as a place with all these people and we know what they do and there's no kind of mystery to it but I think for directors, they have a lot longer gap between projects um, and we're a lot more accustomed to kind of being flexible in a new environment, working with completely new people each time or going to new places. And I think we can forget that for a director, that's the, it's not as, in the most part, it's not as often that they're on, that they're on set. So I kind of see my role as part of a, you know, not being insulting, but not like a guide, but like a kind of, I do have that very protective instinct to say, like, on the set, um, to make it a less intimidating place, um, make it as welcoming as we can. And um, you, yeah. you had a nice example about, uh, uh, let's say, when we talk about differing from how films should be done, and that there is no competition for the best uh, call sheet or mm -hmm. the the most standardly pre pre-produced film but usually each film finds its own way of happening and also each director uh, in for example in Jane's case uh, it's it's very good that she is so experienced she already knows herself and she knows what works and what doesn't you mentioned uh, an example of tech scout 
Yeah, um, from the very early pre-production, Jane kind of made it very clear to myself and, and Phil, who was our first AD, that um, she wasn't going to be on the tech scout um, and that actually that was kind of not necessary that by the time we got to the tech scout that Phil and I would have all the information we needed and, and if there was any outstanding questions, we could always, you know, write them down and come back to her. But during that time, she would be with the actors um, and... And I totally get that. Um, and also we were totally prepared for that. And we knew with months and months of notice that she wouldn't be there. So we kind of did our extra work to make sure we had all the answers. But I can totally see her reasoning. It's that the tech scout in many ways kind of destroys the romance that you've built up about a place or suddenly you're just in a van with heaps of people and they're all talking about how difficult and all the problems they've got and, and um you know, and also kind of catching up, you know, crew catching up as they should, you know, they're building their camaraderie and talking about other stuff, but for a director, um, the bubble of kind of romance that you've built around a place or what you're gonna do on a tech scout can kind of dissolve and and I totally respect and protect that for Jane that it wasn't um useful for her to do that. Um and it wasn't necessary for her to be there. So that was a great um, yeah, great example of just how it's not, uh, how there can be ways to think about it differently, especially if you know that's, that what work, that's what works for you and also to give the people around you good notice. It's not something, you know, if she was to say that the night before, it would be a lot more difficult for us to kind of accommodate than it was six months, 12 mm -hmm. months notice. Yeah, what what you mentioned is is really nice, and it it uh, it's, it connects to this uh, ephemeral space yeah. where where the film is not ready yet, uh, but it's already done. Uh, it's not shot, but maybe things are already happening. And uh, cinematographer and director and also production designer in in the cases of, of fiction films is uh, they have to be able to keep this ephemeral <laughs> film, which is somewhere in their in their internal space or maybe in some more drills, somehow this connection with with the film that is that is being created. And um, I wanted to ask in in your example it's uh, it's a lot connected with uh, let's say um, that you already knew your director before and you had been you had been working but the, were the ways that you found for this film how to uh, how to keep this let's say I love what Ari said romantic so <laughs> how to have this notion of what I'm doing and not getting bogged up with the practicalities and you know the budget and the time and everything so so what were what were the ways in such an experimental film in in understanding what we're doing before you roll the camera mm, I mean the the famous shot, uh, shot in three parts so it's the first it's digital then it's 16 and then it's on high eight and that was like one main decision, like to think about what we should add. And it's with three, each part is with three different performers. And um, I lost your question. So during the, the during the prep, when you when you're discovering the film, you know, and yeah. trying to find out uh, what were the ways of doing it. I mean, the film really, it really came to image like quite intuitively i mean we went to every it was actually it's only two locations it's spain and like north of berlin and we went to the lake north of berlin we went maybe two or three times before shooting like once for three days and two times for maybe each day and just walking around we once surrounded it it's like 17 kilometers and at the end i fell into the february cold water that was like the first encounter. <laughs> it's like, and it's really like finding images and like the director is very, he really knows what he wants in a way, but it's not particular p images. It's like, it's, that's not clear before the shoot at all. And I mean, we were, we were a crew of four people. So it's like sound director, one for the production, me. And then it's three actors or performers. So there's not even a focus puller. That means there is only a certain type of images that I can do, which is very limited because every pan would be like a big time consumer. And that's also a limit that I like. I mean, I also like to prepare a lot and for a fiction, I mean, that's just like, it's just so different. But I really, really enjoy 
to make that film. It was like a very pleasurable experience. And with the Spain part, we arrived three days before the shoot. And we had three days really to encounter the nature. And it's really about us walking in the space and like learning to know about the space. And then like the director would know what he would like to have happened. Um, but we didn't talk before about images at all. And it, it's like a very, yeah, it's a very natural way also, like Marta said, of finding images if you like free, if you don't have certain expectations, if you, and if you can be free and if you have the luxury in a way to be only for people. Mm -hmm. And there's no pressure at all. Like there is pressure doesn't exist if there's, I mean, it's only like it gets dark and it might rain. Um, but you can be so flexible with the weather, you can be flo so flexible with whatever wind. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very, yeah, it's a very intuitive way in, in which you can make uh, images, yeah. I like the, that you brought in the freedom that comes from limitations. So, so very often, the more limitations you have, actually, the more freedom you have. And, uh, and in a way, you have more... Uh, like let's say space for experimentation because mm -hmm. uh, with the, with these limitations usually usually your own expectations uh, are more open to seeing whatever there is and Marta in your case it was also mixed uh, mixed formats right and then mm -hmm. the film is very very physical so there is a lot of physicality embodiment mm -hmm. and uh, and and uh, a lot of this um, kind of like associ associative um, images that form a certain sensation, which similarly to your film is, I couldn't, couldn't imagine how you can put those things in words. It feels like it, this can only spring out of feeling <laughs> into into images. So, mm. so how does this physicality translate into a screen through an experimental project like yours? I think in our case, well, maybe I should explain a little bit how the project came to be. It started with a um, with a dance company called uh, Dançando com a Diferença, which, which you could translate uh, Dancing with the Difference or something like that. And they are based uh, in Madeira. Um, and they invited uh, uh, another theatre company um, to develop something together because that's what they usually do. They always invite either a, a performer or another... Uh, I don't know the word in English, to come and develop work with with their their performers, and then in this case, because COVID came, the, this theater comp company that was invited uh, quick, quickly realized that they couldn't do a, a stage play and and they wanted to do something different, so they invited the director to develop something together. So it was already like a different uh, starting point for me also. Um, then I came into the project, they were already, so the director was already uh, in Madeira on this island and I came a little bit, I don't know, maybe a week or two weeks after he had already been there. He himself, before he went there, he had never been and I think he did a lot of uh, Google scouting, kind of, uh, scouting kind, kind of thing, you know, internet and, and he was uh, showing me some things and we exchanged some ideas. But then when I got there, I think in the beginning, we, one of the first things that we, we did was to get like a feel of the island and of the landscape. So it's always not nice when you can like drive around together and you, you, you feel the road and the landscape and talk about it. So this was the first stage. Um, and islands are always quite special, no? They always have, and this one has uh, amazing uh, geography and, and, and plants and flowers. So we were sort of like getting to know all these things. And at the same time, uh, getting to know the performers also. Um, and sort of like combining this, these things together. And from the beginning, I think uh, George knew that he wanted to film with different uh, cameras and in different formats. And this was already uh, part of the core of the idea of the film. And 
the idea of the film, we kind of had this thought that we wanted it to be, or, or, or George and Andrea, who was writing it and, and developing together, they wanted it to be a sort of, this is going to sound super ambitious, but they wanted it to be a sort of like story of the origin of species or something like this, you know, like the how you go from water to earth to, to plants to bodies and sort of have this uh, fluidity bet uh, between matter, as you said. So uh, we wanted the language of the film also to have these sort of different physicalities. Um, and George is a director who's, who thinks much like an editor, I think. Um, so part of the job is already creating these connections between the different images, the, te the layer of the text, which also was coming in, um, and this uh, eff effortless effortlessness that I think that the film has. Um, as we all know, it's something that it's actually very constructed and, and sort of like thought about and tried out. Um, so in this film in particular, what happened was that we, Already in scouting, we started filming some things, and then we started filming with the performers. And at the end of the day, we, we would sort of like watch everything and, and get a sense of what um, could work and not. And then there was also some, some props and costumes from the theater company that we also brought in and, and, and sort of decided or, or, or thought about who, who could wear what or who, who could interact with what. And then all of this was sort of like pieced together uh, in a first moment in the, in, the, in the shoot and then in a second moment in the editing room uh, when, where the film was also being written, uh, the text. So there was always like all these layers that uh, became connected in the film that you see. And in a sense, it's funny for me because when you watch the film, it, it kind of like ends up being a film about having no body at all, in a way. So, so it's quite beautiful how he managed to, to have such physicali physicality, as you were saying, in the way that it's shot and in the, the materials that, that it uses. But in the end, it's also this sort of like, everything's connected and we are all here. <laughs> it's, it's really um, uh, nice and, and an interesting thing about all these three films is that uh, when we speak here about uh, trying to achieve something natural, whether it's uh, natural in terms of what we're shooting, but also in the process of trying to be intuitive and, uh, and trying to not become a machine <laughs> to, to keep this uh, naturalness uh, in the work we do. All of the three films that, uh, uh, that you have shot are so connected to nature, so the surrounding and the landscape and how humans are in that landscape and, uh, and how the landscape relates to the humans in the screen. They are, all of them have this as a central, uh, in a way, a central theme if you look at the films. So I think uh, I would like to show to the audience uh, three scenes that we have picked from the, from the films. Uh, each, each of the, each of the film um, has this thing, this uh, nature being there throughout the film. But uh, we'll watch these three clips and then we can talk more about this, uh, how the locations and the space affected the films.
Nice words. <laughs> so, uh, landscapes and humans, and how to approach landscapes and humans, what to do with landscapes, and how to translate the landscape and the feeling of a landscape that you have when you go somewhere, how to translate it into images and bring it into a film. Uh, Ari, in, in your case, of course, the film was full of landscape, so this specific clip is not maybe so much uh, centered around landscapes, but it is, you can really feel how the space around the humans is doing something. So, so what was your approach, approach to, the, to, the, to the nature? And of course, uh, um, as a side question later is, uh, how did you approach the fact that you had to shoot something in, in another place? Um, first of all, I was just going to say how much I enjoy watching those clips of the other films. It's so nice to um, just, uh, I don't know, appreciate the kind of difference and the similarities in, in all the works there. And I just um, as a side note, like watching those clips, I was just thinking like how interesting it is to look at, I mean, like planning a shot to think about like how long its duration kind of might be in the final film and like how much that changes kind of what you choose the shot to be, like what the framing is and the movement is and, and how, I don't know, I guess like as DPs, we're like shooting something that's going to be used in an edit and like the relationship between the DP and the editor that's kind of like not direct, but it's so kind of intertwined with the director being like the kind of link. But yeah, just kind of that, yeah, how a shot changes when when you don't cut. And, and how as DPs were kind of like designing usually, for me anyway, usually designing a shot knowing the shot might be on screen for like five seconds and what does its job have to do? Or this shot might be on screen for like two minutes and then what does that change um, in what we would put in the frame or what the movement is or, yeah. Um, uh, and then, yeah, landscape. Um, again, I think it's so specific to each project kind of what in many ways like what's the film's relationship to the landscape and what's the character's relationship to the landscape um in our case um it was obviously um for those of you that have seen the film um phil burbank's kind of the big boss <laughs> of the ranch um and he's very attached to kind of this place that he definitely sees as like his place and and the hills are kind of included in that. Um, and then his brother um, and sister-in-law that you see there kind of, um, yeah, for kind of, I guess, like Phil's relationship to the place is like, I own this, this is mine, this is my like nostalgia, my kind of past is all here. Um, whereas Rose, um, Kirsten's character who comes, I think for her, the landscape, what well, was important for us to set up this kind of idea of like isolation um, and the kind of brutality about a kind of a place that is very isolated and that once she gets there, it's very beautiful in many ways, but there's kind of no escape, um, like a prison with kind of no walls. <laughs> there's nothing, um, no one's coming to kind of help her or save her there. Um, so there were, I think, two thoughts that were in my mind um, that by the time Rose arrives, we've set up. The beauty but also this kind of real isolation um and i guess also it depends on what is the landscape you're shooting and that can even be the same case for inside a room or a school or a, wherever you are it's, it's still like what is usually often we're shooting people and faces and then like what's behind that um that could be wallpaper or that could be mountains or could be anything but um then i guess all that works into kind of lenses and how close or like how um yeah what's what's the character's relationship to that place for us we used a lot of long lenses um in the exteriors because it um that's something that jane loves to kind of stack up the storytelling like there's a shot there with jesse in foreground and then kirsten's kind of in the midground and the car behind that and the mountains behind that like um what i th think i really loved um the way jane uses long lenses to do a wide shot is you can get all this kind of information like in a tunnel almost um and because it's a very long lens like each piece of information is quite a similar size um at a certain distance on a really long lens so 
Um, it's not like someone big and kind of soft in foreground and then someone smaller and the car smaller and the mountain small, like everything's kind of um, a more similar size on a really long lens. So that information is quite um, democratic in a way, isn't it? Um, and yeah, that was probably our, um, our main approach was that um, to shoot as long, super long lenses outside and, and in a place like that, that particular landscape um, really led itself to that. Like it might not work so strongly in somewhere, I don't know, like a really dense jungle where you don't have the ability to see kind of uh, one kilometre ahead of you like you can in, in, a, in a very open place. So I think it's, yeah, looking at the character's relationship to the place and then, and then what the actual reality is that presents itself to you. I don't, yeah, like that, that idea might probably is not a universal approach to every landscape. Um, yeah, but I'd love to hear what, what you guys kind of um, approach was even with like lens size, lens kind of choice to, to the landscape. Um, I think it's really becomes like such a huge part of the, I don't know, the, the flavor of the visual flavor of, of the film, like what lenses kind of, even what like lens length you use. Um, we can jump to Jenny because of if this. If she remembers. <laughs> <laughs> I guess even like lens. generally wide or generally long. <laughs> um, no, we shot this, yeah, it feels like a long time ago. Um, I mean, lens-wise, the first part um, was shot on um, actually HD and um, and and some old Cook um, lenses, and I think I really mainly used 50 and 40, so I wouldn't use. Yeah, I think that's basically what I used. Um, and the second part that's shot on 16, I mainly used, yeah, about the same, like 18 and 25. So that's basically translated to the same thing. And I mean, for me, shooting in nature is really, I mean, or in that film, I, first of all, I love it. I mean, also, mm, I don't know, I feel like it's, a, it's very different than shooting in architecture and shooting like it, I mean, it's less limited in a way, and also more free. And it's, I mean, for me, camera work, anyways, is mainly about, of course, light and but it's like distance. Like that's like one of the or the main, the main question or the most difficult question also is like the distance to, to the person, the distance to to the bodies, and um, and in that case, the landscapes really. I feel like we. It, I was more reminded on like painting than filmmaking. Like also, I don't think we ever watched a film and talked about it in the preparation. We also didn't talk a lot of paint about paintings, but it felt like much more like especially the Spain part that we just watched. I was like thinking about the images. I thought more about painting than any films. I don't, and li really about distance, and not so much framing because the like the framing yeah the framing somehow came with the distance but it really was a question of um um yeah where we are as a viewer also like from the perspective wise like paintings are always also from like a human perspective um and I feel like maybe in that film actually we lose or we leave the human perspective sometimes and we get closer to things in order also maybe we wanted to achieve like a more essential feeling and not only like the... Um, rational. <laughs> yeah, rational, but also like the viewing mm. <laughs> sense, um, but also to touch like other senses. You also, um, I think you mentioned distance. There is also not only one thing that plays a lot in your film is not only the distance of, of you or the camera from from what you're shooting, but also the distance of the people from each yeah. other and, and in the landscape. So so how do you how do you find the right place in this kind of situation where the camera should be and how far 
it should be from people who are in the frame and how far should be the people in the frame be from each other, etc. As long as we could chat because there was no reception. <laughs> <laughs> so we only had our <laughs> cell phones, so that's like that was <laughs> that was a limit. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good that's a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I really, really re I remember that I really enjoy it. Like I remember like we set up the camera and I was like Oh, thanks. Like, not think. I didn't say it, but thinking towards the director. Thanks for the courage that we, you, yeah, that you will take. That like very small people walking in that beautiful landscape because that's not, like, that's not a given. Like, for a director to accept or to wish for those images, which for me was really like the first image that we saw, like the hill with the flowers. I, w I really. I was at the camera, it was shaking because I had to put it up somehow and it was like, yeah, that's that's cool that we can try that mm -hmm. and um, try an image that really goes to the, not the limit, but like, um, yeah, go into, not an extreme, but like, lacking of words it's mm -hmm. go to the extreme of image making go to somewhere where you lack of words so that's that's appropriate <laughs> that it's hard <laughs> to explain because this is this is the pl this is very often i think in this kind of search it's always uh, uh, that sometimes we find the words afterwards to explain what we did sometimes we don't even find sometimes we're forced to say something about it but but very often it's 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 so intuitive and also in in your film marta i think uh, this, uh, when Ari mentioned that even if there is a face in the in the shot, then there is a landscape behind the face, and and I think in your film the bodies also are part of the landscape. So there is there is mm -hmm. a lot of this kind of intertwined. As you mentioned, the body disappears at some point. Even as a viewer, you you sense this <laughs> this embodiment because uh, it transcends these borders of landscape and 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 humans and uh, and even. Um, as Ari mentioned, the length of the shots has has a lot to do with this. Uh, um, let's say, when when we talk about I don't know wide lens or long lens or wide landscape or narrow landscape, it's also the long, very long time span of a shot or a very short time span of a shot. So in this film, where you have a lot of the film that is being found out in the editing and and the rhythms and and this uh, the total effect is is accumulated in the editing when you shoot one shot for this kind of film how how do you uh, what what kind of sensual or or let's say embodied uh, approach do you have to to feel that this is the right place or or mm. this is what what is needed hmm. i was thinking about this landscape question also and 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 now with your question, I feel like in this film there is um, like a sense of discovery somehow. I don't know if you see this, but I, I see when, when I see the images and think back on it. I feel like I was discovering things with the camera, Dis discovering the performers, discovering the way that they were touching the objects and interacting with them them and also a little bit discovering the landscape in a way this is a very obvious example of you know i think that was shot in the scouting or something and then it ended up in in the in the final editing and it's it's one of those things that if we had discussed that uh, before it would be a strange idea for me maybe but then when when it was used and when I saw it in, in the film, it, it just, it's so fair and it's always about what you feel like it's fair within the context of the film. Um, but I think that in this process, I, I feel that a little bit in the images. I feel like there is almost a little bit of curiosity um, because for me in the process, I, I'm, I, even though I, I, I follow the, the thought process behind what, what's being filmed and, and, and how, what, where we are aiming for, um, there's still some things that I don't know, that I will only know when the film is done. And, and I love it when I'm surprised by the, by the final result also. I think there's like so much magic in that for me still. And it's... I don't know. I still love it when it happens. I think it's a nice feeling when because you you know all the images that were shot and still you you can f let yourself feel surprised by by them after you see them um in a certain way. So I think that yeah, I think that there is this sort of like 
discovery, even with these snails, I had never <laughs> seen that being done. <laughs> and I was like, there's hours of footage of that <laughs> because I was just like so concentrated at looking at these, you know, like small details. Um, and I, I, I think I also thought about this clip because it's also maybe a, a good example of this thing that we were talking in the beginning, like how, how things come together. And it was just the, one of the, the props or the costumes that the theater company had from previous shows, because like a lot of the things that you see are also from their previous shows. It was a mermaid costume and, and, and some of the characters use it. And then George, the director, found these uh, mermaid nails online. And then he was just like, OK, we have to film this <laughs> and like, put it in the film so somehow. So that's how like, it was a very simple, you know, uh, uh, how do you say, like, uh, sequence of events mm -hmm. that, that... And that associations between... And associations, yeah. exactly. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know if I traveled a little bit. No, no. <laughs> Every, everywhere we go is the answer. right place. <laughs> but, but yes, just, uh, I, I, I think that in this film, I feel, I, I feel that in the images, I feel like there is this, like, sort of, like, curiosity and also, like, finding out uh, what's happening a little bit and because I didn't spend that much time with the performers also. I, I, I've met them and when I arrived, George already knew them and was more at ease with them. Uh, uh, so I was still also a little bit like getting into it. Um, and I feel like with the nature, some, somehow that also happened because this island is very particular. It's very beautiful, but it's also a little bit claustropho claustrophobic in a way. So there was also like, us trying to understand how can how can we film it because it's it's sort of like a massive landscape but also very much um, it's a mixture of like raw and 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 human uh, human human built uh, kind of thing so there's like all these different areas and all these different um, plants and flowers, so if, if, if you see the rest of the film, you can kind of understand that also. Um, yeah, and I think that in each of, every this, of, of, of these places where we were, either, you know, like filming flowers or filming the, the mountains or filming the ocean, we're also like trying to come to terms of how the landscape made us feel and how we, we could bring it in, in the film. And maybe that, that feeling is a little bit in the images, I think. I really like that you mentioned the discovery part because uh, I feel the same. I think every film is a discovery of something mm -hmm. and very often the discovery continues. So sometimes on the premiere you're like, oh, this is what I did. Mm, I didn't, oh, oh, um, hmm, not bad. <laughs> and now I understand what I was doing. So, uh, and also discovery in a way is uh, is very often written in the, in the way we work as cinematographers. Very often we arrive at some point where the director is al already there, maybe not physically, but <laughs> but but some way has, has been doing the pre-production alone or maybe with a scriptwriter or a producer so so you, in a way you also start discovering the world of the director so mm -hmm. so you you need to have this outsider view a little bit because if you're too intertwined then you don't then you have then you you might not be able to have this uh, let's say a, a little bit of distanced view where you can actually say that I'm going with the camera so far <laughs> until I feel it's good so so I think this this mixture of discovering what you're doing in the creative process and also discovering what the film is while you're doing it it's really beautiful and I think it's in all the films we do it doesn't matter what the scale or the budget or or uh, the, the, even if it's a small thing that we do for one day it's still in a way a detective work or <laughs> an investigation into something and also it's an ins extraction I think it's uh, Jim Jarmusch very beautifully says in about Robbie Muller in, in, in Living the Light documentary he says that uh, when they were shooting uh, dead man then uh, it was really really hard uh, location to get there and uh, and it was it was complicated to get the shots and at some point Robbie said that this is our job to get this rough diamond <laughs> from <laughs> from this place and we will bring it to the editor and they will polish it but we have to extract it we have to bring the material and uh, and Ari when you mentioned this uh, invisible relationship between the editor and the cinematographer uh, I think it's also part of this discovery that the, our editors discover something in our material that we might not even be aware of and then there is the torchbearer <laughs> the director who, who brings <laughs> this from one stage to the other so so I think this the whole process of discovery is, is somehow 
completely intertwined in all the all the layers of our work that we do. And Dari, I really liked uh, when we talked about your film before uh, how you mentioned that this uh, that you start discovering what the film is during the process and sometimes of course uh, let's say in a feature film you have a lot of prep and you shed you shed away some ideas some ideas you throw away and during this process you somehow peel it into into it becomes what it is so so maybe you can share a little bit of how this process of discovery happens in uh, in this such a long time scale and uh, and a very big budget case also budget is not important it's just uh, uh, like how to keep this sense of discovery in this there is a lot of practicalities also there yeah absolutely i mean that i think for me was one of the things i discovered on on this film um is that with that amount of time which i'd never had before i'd always kind of dreamed of it, <laughs> um, that you kind of have your first round of ideas and maybe a second round of ideas in on a on a normal sched normal <laughs> schedule on the schedules I'd experienced in the past, that's where you start shooting because you have maybe that six weeks or so. Um, basically as soon as you have an idea, you're pretty much if there's an idea that works, like you're already starting to like book the gear and book the people and there's a day it's gonna happen and it's already like official um and sometimes you're not even completely convinced of that idea but already there's like a bunch of people cc'd on an email and it's like okay well i guess this is happening <laughs> too late to change um by the way it's never too late to change but it can feel like that by the time there's like you know the guy from the local council with the you know <laughs> sign and the lights the street lights are turned off and everything um so, but I guess with that more time, you can um, start to have not just like the first idea, but like rounds of ideas, drafts, you know, you think about like a script, it sometimes goes through like years of script development and all the drafts till everyone kind of agrees, yeah, this is the best version, now we're ready to shoot. And, and I guess when you have a certain amount of time in pre-production, um, you can do the same thing with your visual ideas or all the ideas, every department, you know, art department, it can go through so many different house designs and like all the different floorboards and the wall texture and the rugs and and the same for camera you know you can go through do you want to shoot 185 maybe you want to shoot square black and white or actually maybe you want to shoot widescreen anamorphic not quite anamorphic like all the kind of ideas that you can really explore and like kind of decide as a whole even you know like would this location be right what about with this costume you know what about you know, and then and then the realities as well of schedule and practicalities also kind of weigh in. So like we were saying, like you're not stretching your resources kind of too thin that you're really setting up a kind of disaster by trying something that's you know not going to be possible. And even you know budget wise, um, in many ways every film is like a low budget film because you're always trying to do like slightly more than you can afford. Um, and in many ways this film wasn't like we're always trying to like push you know slightly beyond um and but what i was going to say about you know budget and pre-production in many ways like it's it's the cheapest kind of it's not quite free but it's almost free like as a as a period time period and as in like an investment in the film um you know it's it's really just yourself and a director with some paper and pens and the internet and you know dropbox and whatever or a car and a camera it's like kind of the most satisfying and like economical affordable part of the whole filmmaking process even it doesn't require any technology or it's just like a few minds in a room with ideas um and i think you know i think about some of the kind of micro budget films I've done and love. One of them called Stray was a film I did with a um, really good friend from film school, Dustin Fenley. And, you know, we'd been talking about that film for years before we made it often is with like small projects. So in many ways, something like that, I still had probably had a year or two, you know, been talking about that film for like 10 years before we actually got to make it. So I think there are ways to have like extended pre-productions on any on any budget on any scale um and then also some that part of the energy is it's not 
fully planned. Like that is actually the point and the energy. And I love that as well to kind of be like instincts, just pure raw instincts and um, is also fascinating. And, you know, we even did some of that on Power of the Dog. There's some really unplanned, I'd call it like planned, unplanned um, sequences with handheld camera with myself and Benedict and Jane and a very, very small crew kind of, you know, and again, it, it has to work for the whole thing of its day exterior, for example, so we don't need much lighting or, um, you know, it's, it's not a part of the script that requires incredibly specific, you know, narrative beats or lines or, you know, so even I think within the, the very structured situation like we were with a script, you know, a very specific script and scenes, there's also moments available for kind of freedom um, to like, shake up all of that yeah so there are pockets of freedom there are pockets yeah. of freedom in every film and <laughs> and then one thing we, what happens with cinematographers in my case is that they've i tend to fall in love with the images when i watch the clips and i tend to fall in love with the people they shoot so i tend to forget the schedule which has just happened with me now so because there was no <laughs> no no i i didn't i forgot i was also the ad so <laughs> i have to give the floor to the audience actually we probably have a lot of questions from the audience and the, uh, i would like to give them a chance to ask questions if there are any if there aren't then i'm just going to take over sure. so there is there is a question which is directed through the channels of zoom towards us it's coming How many shooting days did you have, Ari? Uh, we had like 55, but um, in the middle of that was like three months for COVID shutdown that we hadn't planned. Um, okay. We actually got super lucky with New Zealand as a location that they did crazy shutdown. And then in three months they had zero cases and we started up again. We're back when we thought that was the end. <laughs> We're done, fixed. <laughs> Um, yeah, but about 50, 55 days over um, more time than we'd expected. <laughs> Did that feel enough, like during the shoot? Uh, it never feels like enough. I think you always fill the box that you're given and then want a bit more. Um, but it was, there was maybe, uh, yeah, like about slightly more down on location and quite a remote location in the South Island of New Zealand. And then maybe like 60% there and then 40% in studio. Um, I have noticed that there is this uh, one week, which is always missing. So one week before the shoot, whatever you do, however long you yeah. prepare, there is this just yeah. one week before the shoot. You're like, where did yeah, I need true. that week? <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> oh, we have a, yeah. we have a question. Fantastic. Hi. You're, you're on, you can ask a question. Hello. Um, so I'm from LA and I never went to film school. I don't know the technical side of cinematography, but nowadays, you know, films can be shot on an iPhone and also right at the same time film and, you know, even film cameras are kind of a trend now with photography. So as cinematographers, do you all prefer shooting on film? Do you like shooting with a digital camera? Um, I'd love to hear kind of a little bit more of the technical side. Uh, shall we give the floor to screen, Ari? <laughs> um, yeah, that is, that is the uh, eternal question. Um, <laughs> I think for me, it's like, it's what's right for every project. Like no project is the same. Um, and that's kind of what I love about our job in many ways. It's like every time you start again, it's almost like you can like, like clean everything, like cleanse the desktop, cleanse the hard drives, like start again. Um, and I think it's also very personal to a director. Um, you know, we don't really do our job in a bubble. We're always working with someone and they have a way that they want to work. So, it might be like, say, 
you know, recent project I did, the director really loved the look of film, but we were also working with the film that was going to have a young child in it. And, and he was someone that likes to roll the camera a lot um, and roll multiple cameras a lot. So we actually decided that even though the film look was great, um, the reality was that it wasn't right for us. And we'd kind of find another way to get the film look be still part of the film and, and use the good parts of digital, which is, you know, an economic kind of advantage to allow him to still work in the way he wanted to work with the actors. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my take on it. Um, it's not always the kind of visuals are not always the, in many ways, the like number one reason why someone would shoot digital or not. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do, what do you, um, how about you, Jen? You, you shot both of your films on almost everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. M- mine is a parade of all that that's there now, I think. Um, I think that for me, it's uh, obviously a, a similar, similar answer. I think it depends on the project. But what I th- find interesting in, in this period that we, we are living now is... Uh, a little bit what what you said in your question that you have all these different uh, cameras and in the end they're all different tools so what's stimulating is how can you use these different tools uh, to help and to add something to the film you're 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 doing and in this case it's quite amazing like I, I hate, like, uh, I can't use an iPhone to take pictures because I always had, like, a, a, a bad one, and so I never I can never use it. And in this film, we shot a lot of stuff on iPhone also, and it's just how you use it, how you use it in the language of, of the film you are you are trying to do. Um, and 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 that's really cool. If you If you have more tools to use, then... You can explore more more things. So different projects, I think, bring different different uh, challenges and also different opportunities to to use different mediums. I think. Yeah, there's not so much to add, but <laughs> except that I mean, I wouldn't lie. I would say I don't li- really like filming on film because of the the aspect aspect I said before. Also, the limitation, which I just really like, and there's th- always keeps a certain surprise or secret till like after the shooting day at least and that's I yeah that's what I like and I also like imperfections in a way and that comes also with the film material and uh, yeah it looks I mean the what we all know like the (coughs) sensuality of it is something that's not on digital but it I mean it's just one way of it's one layer in the film making process um. Yeah, and there's something also that might be very obvious, but it's also the camera you choose also has an impact on on the way you you film, and with film, it also brings this uh, degree of concentration that you might not have uh, with a different camera, which is also interesting. The and time then limit. This, yeah. yeah, the time limit, and 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 also the. Um, the portability of things so like all, all, also like the physicality of the camera is also something that has an impact on the, on, on the, the way you film um, yeah thanks so we have um, the next question waiting Karina is has a question hi 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 I'm Corina Nielsen uh, I'm an actress from Cologne Germany and I always had the feeling that the connection to the cine- uh, uh, to the camera people <laughs> are very um, near and very close um, because you are somehow the first eye who is um, watching our work um, and sometimes uh, on set uh, uh, they speak to me and sometimes not so how it is for you do you like to speak to the actors or would you like more to have a distance this is a very interesting question like who wants to go first <laughs> i i can go um um i 
certainly there's a very close connection that I also feel and somehow you always fall in love with your the people in front of the camera not always but like mostly really and um, I don't think it's about not wanting to talk to the actors at all I can't imagine that any DOP in the world would not want to talk to the people in front of the camera I would just I'm really can't imagine it's really sometimes in fiction films is it's there's like a certain certain directors doesn't don't really want it in a way like it's not there's like they shed the actors from like the whole team maybe not the DOPs but then you've you're then sometimes I feel like I'm in the middle of of that of I like it in a gray area um, in that space where the director wants really like the closest contact and I feel like I step back so there is no intervention or in, yeah does that make sense uh, Sometimes it's like a dance yeah yeah for me oh, it's for me I think that pointing a camera to someone is always uh, something strange. <laughs> I know it's might maybe strange for a cinema cinematographer to say this, but I feel like it's there's something in this act of, of, of you wanting to capture someone's image or wanting them to act a certain way. It, there's something strange about this, no? I don't know. Um, and I'm always um, a bit... Uh, I think I, I I don't know if I talk with the actors necessarily, but I think that when I'm behind the camera, I try to to make some sort of eye connection and and just like to say, I know this is strange. <laughs> we have a camera between us, <laughs> but you know, it it can also be something interesting. So you know, I think I try to do something like this. I don't know. I feel strange myself uh, sometimes in the process. Uh, of, th of this interaction, so I don't know. <laughs> Ari? Yeah, I agree. I think we're all like kind of, there's like a slight awkwardness that we're all like feeling that again, like you're saying, there's not specific words for it. Um, it's incredibly kind of intimate relationship, but in many ways it's kind of like not direct or it's like imbalanced. Like one of us is watching the other like very closely mm -hmm. and the other one doesn't have that kind of back in the other direction um and then there's some kind of a magical thing that i think happens very human when you stare at, like at someone's face and and their physicality for so long you do start to form like a really close bond with them and you know them on this kind of very intimate level which weirdly they don't know you back um and I've heard kind of editors describe the same thing when they meet an actor at a premiere and kind of want to hug them. And the actor's like, who are you? <laughs> they know you so well. Um, so yeah, it's something really fascinating. I feel like there's room for like a whole thesis there about, about that, that relationship. And, and also in many ways, you're the camera operator or the, whoever's operating the camera, like you are in the room and oftentimes you're really experiencing very, you can, quite often be the closest person to someone who may be going through like a really intensely kind of emotional experience. And sometimes it might just be the two of you in a room. Sometimes, you know, you're so close, like some part of your body might be touching this other person's body as they're experiencing this really intense kind of um, whatever's necessary for the scene. So there's, there's something like so close. And then like you're saying, Marta, there's also something between you um, or there's kind of, the observer and the and the person um, in front of the camera. So yeah, it's it's super complex. But but for me, I think also, um, like Ellen was saying earlier, DPs, we're probably there's probably not a coincidence that we chose to like take our life like behind the camera. We feel very safe there. <laughs> Maybe acted slightly the opposite. I'm not sure, but um, for me, even sometimes if I don't talk to actors maybe as much as, as they would expect there's like a kind of respectful like let you do your work and maybe some kind of um I don't know even like 
not intimate, intimidate or like nervous, but um, yeah, I think DPs are like, uh, yeah, we feel very safe behind our camera, <laughs> our protection. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks so much for, for asking. I think, yeah. These answers are also really great. Uh, when you said that there's not much to add, everything you, you say, you're saying what I just wanted to say. So I just wanted uh, to say about the, that it's even weirder for editors because because very often they they forget that the, that the actor doesn't know them. So uh, on premiere they would say, "Oh hi," and the actors are like, "Oh, I have no idea who this was." So so it's it uh, this kind of transition from one uh, how an actor. Uh, is how the image of the actor is taken away from the actor and it's transformed from one level to, to the next is quite interesting. But also one thing which I have experienced is that uh, in w when you're shooting something, then very often director looks at an actor with an idea of what they want. But DAP just looks at the actor and sees what the actor is doing. So sometimes the actor would do something that the director didn't want for the take, but the first look that you give to the actor once the take is over is, I saw what you did. I saw, I saw that you did this thing. Maybe it doesn't go to the film. Maybe it wasn't what the director wanted, but I saw it and I felt it and I was there. So, mm -hmm. so maybe the DP is the closest uh, to the audience in a theater in a way because DP is just looking at the actor and just seeing what the actor is doing and acknowledging it. So I also have felt that the first look that you give after the take sometimes for the actor is even more important than when the director comes because of course directors, they, they have their idea of what they want to have and then it becomes practical. But the very first first look that I give to the actor when the take is over and all this <laughs> intense emotion is over is I saw what you did and then I approach it, I approach I woo, I lost the words I appreciated it so so I think it's uh, it's part of appreciating of what is happening in front of the camera and and being there fully and as always there are plans and then there is life so the life says that we have to finish now. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the time went so quickly that uh, probably we'll have to continue this, these talks later. Uh, Ari will have uh, uh, a chance. Uh, Ari will have a chance, but mostly <laughs> camera studio participants will have a chance to, to have a separate Q&A with Ari after a break. But uh, to the rest of the audience and, and the participants and the team here, I would like to say thank you very much. There is a birthday boy here. I'm not going to sing. It's, a, it's not a talent show in this terms. So, so we just uh, want to thank the team and the audience. And Ari, Arta, Genero, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Bye.